This is my attempt at doing a Dyneema Composite Fabrics Explained video. Before I get started, I want to go over the scope of what I want to cover in this video. My main goal is to explain the naming scheme and show you how to use it to better understand the different fabric types. And along the way, I'm going to end up giving a basic background on Dyneema Composite Fabrics, uh, go over common questions, and hopefully clear up some confusions, and probably rant a little bit. Lastly, I also want to try to give examples of all of the varieties of DCF being used and reasons for why these specific types are being used where they are in ultralight gear. I actually want to begin with DSM's own website for their Dyneema brand. DSM stands for Dutch State Mines. This is a huge company that is based in the Netherlands. And guess what? <laughs> this website is absolutely useless if you want to learn anything about their products uh, in relation to pretty much anything, but especially in relation to the outdoor gear community. So here you have this lovely Dyneema landing page. It's not super useful. Uh, if I go on uh, industries, let's look, sports and lifestyle. Uh, I see a, I see a tent here, equipment. Here we go. Here's their one paragraph that they have on the outdoor gear community. That's it. You really can't uh, get anything here. Even if you dive into like, they've got articles that are linked here. This one we'll go over in a second. Uh, but you know, for the most part, there's really not much here. If you dig under their technologies and form factors tab, you can get a little bit more. This covers basic properties, uh, 15 times stronger than steel like for like, which I believe is weight to weight. The resistance to abrasion, the basic little things. If you go to uh, Dyneema fibers, get a little bit more. It talks about how, you know, you have your, your brand name for ultra high molecular weight polyethylene. This is what the Dyneema fibers are. The other name for this is Spectra. And then uh, Dyneema fabrics you have a little bit on their DCF line. And here's two paragraphs. I don't know why they're talking about abrasion performance because uh, they don't specify what type of DCF. Uh, they talk about how it can be tailored, but they don't give any actual products. You can't like, okay, so what kind of dynamics do they, do they have one Dyneema composite? Oh, they have, there's a, it's plural, so there must be more than that. There's no info anywhere. They talk about wovens. This is another thing you see in backpacking. I'm not going to talk about it today, but these come up here. What kind of wovens are there? Where can I find more? If you want some basic bullet points for the fibers, that's here. There's the DCF paragraph. There's really no good information there. Nowhere on the site are you going to find any specifications or details of their product line. It used to be easier to find like the history of DCF on Hyperlite Mountain Gear's website. There was a 2016 blog post, but this is all gone now. Uh, so uh, the DSM acquires Cubic Tech blog post or press release on Dyneema's site is the one that actually is the, is the this is the key source for this information now. Uh, this is a good read if you want to learn about the history. It basically goes over that they acquired a Mesa, Arizona based company, Cubic Tech, and they're the roots of Cubic Tech as uh, developing high-performance sailcloth that won the America's Cup, things like that. Uh, in that 2016 blog post from Hyperlight, they talked about like how they were uh, trying to collaborate, it seemed like, for a different naming scheme. Uh, they were starting to, and this is still used on Hyperlight's site where you see DCF8 and DCF. 10 um if you go into the specs dch 50 here if you go into shelters and specs this naming scheme uh but the blog post that talks about this sort of thing that's just it's it has disappeared from the internet now i should have made this video a couple weeks ago the one thing nice about hyperlight is that they have a really nice condensed introduction to DCF. So from any of their product pages, 
if you go to specs and learn more about their fabrics, you have this page that they've had for a while. Um, oh, if you want to read more about this 2015 rebranding, I should visit, I should visit this blog. Ah, right. Anyway, so Harold is the most revolutionary new material technology, formerly Cuban fiber. You know, they talk about this, they talk about, you know, basically what Dyneema fibers are and then what uh, the DCF composites are. And they talk about, you know, where each one, they use it in their product line. And they talk about the Dyneema composite hybrids and uh, also hard line with Dyneema, which is the woven fabric with Dyneema ripstop. The one cool, the one cool thing to gain from this that uh, a lot of people actually don't seem to know, the, the Dyneema fibers and fabrics are primarily the the ones that they use for like that hyperlight uses the ones that you find in the U.S. are manufactured in two facilities in Arizona and North Carolina. So if you buy something from Z-Packs or Hyperlite, there really is a lot of U.S. manufacturing involved if you live in the U.S. and you care about that sort of thing. Um, and there used to be, uh, going back to the blog, there used to be a blog post on Hyperlite uh, that was a, that I believe was called uh, Why Cuban Fiber? It Just Makes Sense. Uh, that was written by their founder, Mike. And it talks about Cuban basic history, its rationale for using it. Uh, it's a good quick read, but it's not up anymore. So I guess we're not talking about it. All right, so now to get into the nuts and bolts of what I really wanted to talk about here, and that's deconstructing or demystifying the differences between different versions of DCF and how to make sense of this ugly, intimidating technical naming scheme that you see here, uh, which is the one thing that you can use to definitely tell you what type of fabric you're dealing with. Why? Because the common way of referring to these fabrics by weight is not entirely reliable. Uh, hopefully this gets better, and if you can sort of understand uh, Hyperlite Mountain Gear's desire for their different naming scheme with the DCF8, DCF number, and you can sort of see that like, I have the categories still here in the spreadsheet. One thing you may notice if you are into this, if you're familiar with a lot of gear that's uh, been sold in the ultralight market for the past couple of years or even further back, Z-Packs still refers to a 0.74 ounce per square yard and MLD, a 0.75 ounce per square yard Cuban fiber on their site. That's not this. This 0 0.70 fabric, all of the fabrics you, that you see that are referred to as 0 0.74, 0 0.75 are this. CT2E 0 0.08. And this now, if you look at Hyperlite's site, this is the 0.8 ounce per square yard Cuban fiber. This makes things really confusing. The weights have changed slightly over the years. I believe uh, as an attempt to correct and more accurately represent the true weight of the fabric, um, they've altered the, the I guess, the, I, want, I wanted to say the name, but it's not the name. They've altered the, uh, the specified weight. Uh, it's possibly also a result of changes to the makeup or construction of the composites. But some places have not changed this uh, from whenever they first posted their products or they first wrote their spec pages on their websites. And it makes it hard for someone new to these fabrics to compare offerings from different companies unless they have the technical name listed somewhere in the specs to tell you exactly what's going on. The other one is 1.43 and 1.5, although you never see 1.5 ounce per square yard listed anywhere pretty much ever. But 1.43 and 1.5 are the same. Using 1.43 is the most common, although it seems like 1.5, the bumped up weight is probably the more accurate, more recent one. I'm not sure. Maybe it just didn't take. Um, it's hard to find this anywhere. But anyway, to break this down. So this technical name seems like a complete jumble. But if you look here at these columns, you may start to see how this breaks down. I have it pretty well laid out. The first thing in the technical name, the part we can ignore from here on after this, they all start with CT. And this is simple. It stands for Cubic Tech. This just designates that the product is from the family of products that originated with Cubic Tech. So it separates it out for uh, DSM in their gigantic product catalog. So CT tells you it's Cuban fiber, and that's it. From here, you have a number, 
And for even more fun, this occasionally has a decimal point. Uh, but this number is just an abstracted way of designating the Dyneema fiber thread count. Or essentially, a relative amount of Dyneema fibers per area, which translates mostly into tensile strength. So you can see it goes all the way from 0.3, uh, which is an incredibly small amount. So you can imagine you're more than tripling your Dyneema fiber count when you move to these next four types, and then doubling the amount again for the next two, and so on. Uh, one thing you'll typically hear is that 0 0.8 ounce per square yard cube of fiber has twice the fiber content of 0 0.5. The one ounce has the same uh, Dyneema fiber count, two and two. And so this continues all the way from 3.5 uh, all the way to nine. These fibers are laid out in a sort of grid uh, running 90 degrees opposed from one another, but they are not woven. If you delaminate the composite, you can see just how fine these Dyneema fibers actually are. They're incredibly, incredibly thin. The next thing you wanna break down is the film that's being used. You have a letter designating the specific type of film being used, as well as a number which seems to designate the film thickness, uh, which I believe is actually a direct measurement in mils or thousands of an inch. For context on how ridiculously thin that is, uh, here I have conversions in inches, millimeters, and microns. I don't know if it's even correct, but it's there. Um, and this is the base polyester film that is used to sandwich the Dyneema fiber grid. So there would be two pieces of this film one on either side. Uh, I'm going to cut in some video right now of me handling the film from the edge of a roll of 0 0.51 cuban. Uh, here you can see just how wispy and delicate it is on its own. A little tensile strength and basically no tear strength whatsoever. So the, uh, the E and the K designate different types of mylar and they have apparently different properties. All of the very popular common stuff we see on tents and tarps right now are using the E variant in the low weight versions. As you get into the higher weight fabrics, you'll start seeing K.18. This is both a different type of mylar and an increased thickness. Now, interestingly, if you ever dig up older info on Dyneema, you may find reference to K.08. Originally, this was all K-type film, and there were some issues with the thin stuff, apparently. My info for this is basically one thread on backpacking light relating to older variants of Cuban losing waterproofness or hydrostatic head with wear. Here's a direct quote from Dan Durston in the thread, who is someone I would trust on this subject. In, in summary, old K.08 Cuban variants demonstrated like micro porosity of aging, and they fixed it by changing something about the film. Here we have an HK variant. I'm not sure what this means. The H may actually be referring to something about the fibers count, but I would assume it's a different type of mylar. I'm not sure. It kind of doesn't make sense. Uh, the next part of the naming scheme, you'll end up with a slash. If you have a base material with an additional layer laminated to it. So here I've got listed the parent fabric here for these hybrid-ish and hybrid fabrics. So this occurs in the hybrids as well as other specialty fabrics which have other thin films bonded to them. So this here designates another mylar layer, uh, K.18. You'll see this with the special color laminates and things like camo that ZPAX offers as an option. Uh, I would assume this before the K.18 uh, varies with color, it varies with the laminate. It's probably not important property-wise. It's most likely just describing cosmetics but when you get into the true hybrids, you'll start seeing WOV, or which means woven, and this is telling you what the face fabric is. 0.32 is the 50 denier face, and uh, 0.6 is the 150 denier face. And this number, 0 0.32, 0 0.6, uh, I have no idea what it means. Uh, the only thing you need to know is just that these variants use the 50 denier face, and the five ounce per square yard is 150 denier face. Here, is an interesting fabric. This one also can get people confused. People could think that these two fabrics are the same, especially because they are listed as the exact same weight. They're always called, or at least on Hyperlite site, they are five ounce per square yard DCH or DCH woven, Dyneema composite hybrid woven, or just Dyneema composite hybrid. 
the designation is, well, this is the five ounce woven and this is the regular five ounce. Uh, people could think that these two fabrics are the same and these fabrics are very, very far from being the same fabric. And this is the problem with a weight-based naming scheme. And visually in online product photos, it looks pretty similar. It's not necessarily clear or it hasn't always been made clear <laughs> that these are different, uh, but this fabric is special. There are plenty of different variations of Dyneema hybrids that are very uncommon. Uh, you get Dyneema's bonded with denim, Dyneema's bonded with leather, all sorts of weird stuff. But in the ultralight gear space, the full woven Dyneema, or also sometimes called full spectra, but you know not called that by Dyneema, it's a really cool fabric because you have the same waterproofness and ability to seam tape fabrics as all of the other DCF, DCH, but you're going from 150 to near polyester plain weave face, not ripstop. It's not the best, most tightly woven, and polyester isn't even really a first choice for abrasion resistance. I have no idea why they chose to use this polyester plain weave face fabric on these really like crazy expensive hybrid fabrics. And you're moving to what is essentially the most abrasion resistant woven fabric in the world, as far as I know. It's this 375 denier face is 100% woven Dyneema fibers, the same like super thin fibers that you saw in the video I cut in earlier. This is an extremely expensive fabric, even compared to regular DCF. And that's a lot of why you don't see it used commonly. And also probably why I can't dig up any technical details. Please someone send me a link to a spec sheet. Okay, so next I wanted to get into where all of these fabrics are being used right now, or in some cases where they've been used in the past. So starting here, where is this crazy light 0.34 ounce per square yard cubeman being used? One place right now. But it's weird. It was used most commonly in the old z -Packs pocket tarp, which doesn't exist anymore. The pocket tarp is now just the hexamid, and it's in you know the 0.5 one ounce variant. Uh, but it's also being used in the Big Agnes Fly Creek Carbon Fly. And this blows my mind. Andrew Skirker had a, a recent uh, Instagram post of you know him where he's pitched the, the tent and the fly is just torn. You're, this, is, this isn't really something that you want to use unless you're pretty crazy about going super, super ultralight. And it's completely bananas that a large company... Uh, went out and used this and it's there's no way it's going to end well with sort of more normal just like not used to you know this is this is going to be a lot of people's first dcf tent maybe you know if they're coming from like the more uh common you know places to buy it this might be the only dcf tent really that's going to show up in rei or something like that it's, it's not going to be great and we'll get into more about why that is later and so going into that, next we have the 0.5 one ounce. And this is ZPAC's standard shelter material. And it's as light as most people will reasonably go for making shelters out of. Uh, Tarp Tent also uses it in their lithium series. Yama Mountain Gear has it as a request option. It used to be uh, more common for their tarps. They had it listed separately. Now you have to ask for it. And Big Agnes is actually using it for the floor material of their tents the bathtub floor of 0.51 ounce cuban and it's it doesn't make any sense at all it seems silly even if you're using it uh with an additional ground sheet it, do, it doesn't make any sense at all it's just silly bad idea you know you always imagined that when the you know less cottage companies get into this they'd mess it up but this isn't the way you would think they'd mess it up. You'd think they'd mess up the construction. Uh, the 0.67, these are other color laminates where this uh, where this shows up. Basically, you'll find these on ripstop by the roll. Uh, that's, more, that's mostly it. Uh, then you have the camo, and this is z -Pax camo. This is where you'll see this for the most part. Nothing in this field here. 0.7 ounce per square yard cuban. So this is the weird one. 
uh, this popped up and the availability has gone down. It's probably not being produced very widely. But this was sort of thought to be like, oh, this is uh, Cuban with better abrasion resistance and uh, you know better puncture resistance, but not a lot of the weight. And when you dig into some of the things we'll look at later with some of the spec sheets, you'll see that maybe the puncture resistance really wouldn't any be, be any better. And this fabric is made with the older uh, Mylar film. So it's weird. No one's using it. Uh, I thought it was interesting at one point, but it doesn't, you know, there's nothing really to talk about. Now, to get into where a lot of things are being used, the 0.8 ounce variant. This is being used in hyperlight shelter flies. z heavy shelters, if someone says they have a spruce, spruce green z shelter, this is the heavier weight Cuban fiber. 0.8 ounce, not 0.74. Uh, this is Yama's standard material now, as well as MLD's for most of their uh, their line. And it's also being used uh, in MLD's and Bora's Cuban bivy floors. So this is the lightest weight you can go reasonably for the floor of something that you're gonna be using. I've personally used uh, a Bora Cuban bivy and I wouldn't use it without uh, like a thin plastic ground sheet, honestly, still. But, you know, for the sake of using it with a thin ground sheet, it's nice to have that thread count so you know that stitches aren't less likely to pull out and the fabric's just less likely to just spontaneously tear from you rolling around or moving. <laughs> 0.8 ounces, the latest you should go for the floor of a shelter. That's it's it, that's any lighter than 0.8 is stupid light. Now, one ounce is the common standard for shelter floors with DCF. This is used on Z-Packs, shelter floors, tarp tents, lithium floors, Yama gears, floors, they're all one ounce. This is sort of the agreed upon standard, except for Hyperlite. Now, Hyperlite uses 1.3 ounce per square yard Cuban for their shelter floors. What's different about 1.3 ounce? It's just a higher Dyneema thread count. So, you know, it's the same Mylar film, but the Mylar film doesn't really affect too much. Um, you'd think it would affect abrasion resistance more, maybe. It's hard to say, but Hyperlite uses this to, to be different, uh, and this fabric's hard to buy. I actually found some on Dutch, Dutchwear gear, has had some of this in stock at one point. Now, the 1.43 ounce, here's where we start getting into packs. Uh, so this is the heaviest weight that you can really find anywhere of the non-hybrid Cuban fibers. So Z-Packs food bag is made of this. Old Appalachian Ultralight uh, balloon packs, or packs with the window feature. We're using this, as well as Palante's uh, Cuban Simple, the front panel. Some of the panels on the Palante Cuban Simple, we're using this 1.43 ounce per square yard Cuban. The 2.15 is elusive, and it seems to only be a parent material for the, uh, the hybrid fabrics. So to go over, here's this is Appalachian Ultralight. Uh, unfortunately, unfortunately, Appalachian Ultralight is on indefinite hiatus. Cody, the owner of Appalachian Ultralight, was willing to go to the extreme end of the Ultralight spectrum of making some of his packs, like the balloon pack. Uh, these sort of material choices are uncommon, but they aren't necessarily new. Joe from Z-Packs began Z-Packs making packs that were really similar in material choice to this. One another one of those things that sort of disappeared from the internet um, on z -Packs, they used to have Joe's old gear lists and they would list uh, his backpacks as coming in at 7 ounces and that's super similar to uh, what Cody's done here so more recently like the only ones you might be able to find anywhere would be uh, used Appalachian Ultralight Balloon Packs and then you have you know the through series where they were using it uh, a little bit along with the 2.92 but you'll see it as just like a, a material but not necessarily the whole pack and then the cuban simple 1.43 and here's the only photo of the palante cuban simple that i could readily find uh, those are sort of things i wanted to show just because they're you know it's not easy to not easy to find a lot of uh, those examples anywhere but when i say z packs or hyperlite or whatever you can look on their site and you can find it so the 2.92 ounce per square yard uh, Dyneema Composite Hybrid Fabric, 
This is Z Packs Packs. They're backpacks. This is what they use. Superior Wilderness Designs is another company. They use this for the uh, the main body of their DCF packs. The other weird one is 3.5. This is sort of the the strange one. It's the spot where you know Hyperlight once again just uses the slightly heavier version. Hyperlight doesn't use 2.92 ounce per square yard cubin for uh, their backpacks whatsoever. The white Hyperlite packs are 3.5 ounce per square yard cubin, and MLD followed suit with this later on when they started making uh, their cubin packs. They're using this variant. The 5 ounce per square yard cubin, uh, this is the Hyperlite black packs. Superior Wilderness Designs uses this for the bottom of their packs. Uh, Palante's Cuban V2 was 5 ounce per square yard cubin. They've since moved on to <laughs> the world of dimensional polyant, which hopefully uh, I'll get into another video about that, but that one's a little bit simpler and might need less explaining. And then I've talked about the uh, five ounce woven, the full woven Dyneema face, five ounce fabric. These are used in the fancy hyperlight packs, the really expensive stuff, and on some McHale packs, as a full spectra option is sometimes what he lists it as. I thought I had links to this, but I have no idea where they are. Okay, so here's Mikhail Packs. So here's another place. This is a another niche one if you want to look into some sort of ultralight packs. Uh, Mikhail is very much on the you must have a proper frame, you must have a proper hip belt, but it makes sense because he's sending a lot of packs to Everest and crazy mountaineering expeditions like that, and that's what he gears stuff to. But one of the, uh, you'll you'll see really cool examples of the uh, the full woven, you know, spectra of full Dyneema hybrid being used. It's this white fabric here on this pack. Uh, he'll also, you know, there are examples of it being dyed and all sorts of crazy things like that. I'm trying to find. He's got some really, these are really beautiful packs. <laughs> even has like two-tone dyed, faded variants of the full woven Dyneema. This one you can really tell. Here it looks really cool. You get that crinkly effect that you're sort of familiar with with the full wolf and Dyneema. There's some really great pictures on the McHale pack sites if you want to uh, dig through it. The other thing I wanted to cover was uh, Ripstop by the Roll. So their their site is good. Uh, it's a good entry point. If you look in the specs, they'll list the, the technical name of the product and they'll talk a little bit about its properties. You know, this has more Dyneema fiber thread count than this, so on and so forth. Um, but the other cool thing with Ripstop by the role that's going on right now is it looks like they're cataloging some sample books of Dyneema. They, they appear to be real. Um, hopefully this will be coming out soon uh, at some point, probably. I, I, I want to hope it's going to be out soon after this video goes up. Um, but it looks like this will be a good chance for people to get their hands on uh, a lot of different types of Dyneema, and they're including at least a, a abbreviated spec sheet with each piece, which is great. Um, you can already order just the fabric sample packs from Ripstop by the Roll, which is awesome. Um, and they're really like they're the main source for the widest variety of uh, Dyneema and Dyneema composites. So yeah, hopefully this is coming soon. And to go along with that, the other crazy thing is they're whipping up their own custom fabrics, and we're gonna be start and we're gonna start seeing some really really cool things come out of Ripstop by the roll with Dyneema. Uh, this is the like one of the crazy ones that caught my eye. There's more coming. There's uh, wovens that are super super light, uh, not full wovens, but much along the lines of the typical. Uh, Dyneema X that you see used on packs. But 
the full Dyneema mesh, things like that. This this is start this is going to start expanding, and the things that are beyond uh, the DCF, the DC, uh, the name the stuff beyond the Dyneema composite fabrics and the Dyneema composite hybrids. That's gonna that that envelope is going to really start expanding, and it's it's going to eventually be much more than can ever be condensed into one video. Uh, it, it's going to be a really interesting time for the Ultra Lake gear making space. There's probably going to be a lot more choices and a lot more trying to a lot more to try to digest coming soon. So when talking about spec sheets, I actually have these are these are the only ones that I have the full specification table as far as I know on. I had to really dig around to find these, um, but I have you know four different versions, and this is nice to look at. I wish I had these for every version of DCF out there. It's it's really great to be able to have these because it helps you understand how the changes in Dyneema fiber count or the changes in the Mylar film, how it affects the properties of the fabric. What's it going to do to the strength? What's it going to do to like puncture resistance? You know the tear strength of the fabric, and you know this is the only source we have for this information. Thankfully, I have enough different examples here that we can you know we can sort of see what's going on and what changes make what happen. So here, uh, I have the box around the uh, the fabric weight. You know, we have the 0.5 ounce, 0.8 ounce, one ounce per square yard, and 3.5 ounce per square yard. So we have the lightweight shelter fly material, the heavyweight shelter fly material, uh, the most common floor material, and the uh, sort of not Z packs low end weight wise, but the low end weight wise backpack material that you'll see being used. So a lot of what's, you know, commonly used out there being represented here. So to start with the CT1E.08, you know, we have our values here for, you know, your tensile strength. And this is the fabric being pulled how you think it would be pulled. It's being pulled along its length. Uh, this is when the fabric fails. And this would be a one inch strip of the fabric. It would require 63 pounds of force for it to fail. Um, in the same standard, you have the percent elongation. I don't know uh, what the conditions are for this percent elongation, but I'm assuming it's at a fairly high load. Um, then we have the tear strength, you know, 14 pounds of force. Um, because I don't know exactly how this is being applied, I don't know what the standard is exactly. We don't know what this means except in comparison to the other versions, and that's sort of what the whole point of the spec sheets are. They'll let you compare um, your puncture resistance and your water resistance. So what's cool here is that we have CT1E.08 and CT2E.08. So the only change here is you've doubled your Dyneema fiber thread count, and the Mylar film has stayed the same. What happened to the fabric? Well, tensile strength has increased significantly. Um, but oddly, you have slightly more percent elongation. So this sort of leads me to believe this isn't the same pressure being applied. It has something to do with the tensile strength test, and it's the elongation at a point in the tensile strength test. Who knows? But what's interesting here is the tensile strength has increased greatly, but the tear strength has only increased slightly. And then something that I originally, when I first, you know, got into the ultralight backpacking Cuban fiber world, I didn't think that increasing the Dyneema fiber count would improve the puncture resistance. I thought that was all about the Mylar film layer. And after getting your hands on some of that Mylar film and seeing how thin it is, you sort of understand how little that really applies to the material properties. It's mostly the waterproofness. That's mostly what the Mylar film does. The puncture resistance has almost doubled much like the tensile strength, when you increase the Dyneema fiber thread count. Thicker mylar isn't going to improve your puncture resistance. Basically, at all. And we see that in our next example when we're going from CT2, CT2, E.08, K.18. The difference between this fabric and this fabric is only the difference in the mylar film. And some of that's interesting because it does affect the tear strength, apparently. 
I don't know how much I believe these figures, but the tensile strength is exactly the same. There is no change in tensile strength. Puncture resistance is exactly the same. So I would believe, and this is what all the companies say, uh, this fabric would have higher abrasion resistance. Tabor abrasion, which we find in the, uh, you know, you'll see in the Dyneema composite hybrids, it's not being used on these. I think this is mostly due to what the Tabor abrasion uh, test is. And I think on very low friction fabrics, it starts to throw out really, really wonky results. I think that's probably more of why it's being used, maybe because of the use cases that, you know, Dyneema wants these fabrics used for. Maybe that's also why they're not listing it. But I don't think it's uh, deception or, um, you know, them trying to, you know, push the abrasion resistance under the rug. I think it's mostly a function of uh, what the test is able to actually test. So the, uh, the important things to drill down from this are that if you increase the denima fiber thread count, you're, you're vastly increasing your tensile strength. You know, if you double it, you're almost doubling your tensile strength. If you double it, you're almost doubling your puncture resistance. So these are the these are the things that you know we really see as failure modes for shelters. So stepping up to the 0 0.8 ounce per square yard cubing can really be worth it for some people. Now and then going to the one ounce per square yard, this is where we see that you know the no difference in puncture resistance whatsoever, no different no difference at all in tensile strength. So this is uh, where we, you know, anecdotally, we believe that this is way better for abrasion resistance. Uh, but is it use? Is it you know? Is it worth it at all to use this one ounce per square yard cuban in a shelter? Uh, it doesn't seem like it. We're not getting increased puncture resistance, and we're not getting increased tensile strength. The tear strength is marginally better, but there's doesn't seem like there's a whole lot of purpose of using this one ounce per square yard cube in, in shelters at all. So if you want the increased puncture resistance, you want the higher uh, Dyneema fiber thread count. And this also increased tensile strength. The Mylar film, all it does is it's going to help you out with abrasion resistance a little bit. That's mostly what you need to know. Moving on to the, you know, you can look a little bit at the, I don't have anything to compare to with the other hybrids. I'd be interested to see um, the 2.92 ounce compared to the 3.5 ounce per square yard cube. And I'd really like to see that spec sheet. Um, but, you know, we can see the tensile strength has, you know, gone up a considerable amount when you compare it to um, the, just the regular cubans. But you've changed all the variables. You've changed the uh, Dyneema fiber thread count, you've quadrupled it, you've only tripled your tensile strength, and you've gotten this possibly different film, and then you have a whole nother layer that you've added on as well, this woven fabric, and that gives you this great, you know, abrasion resistance, and most likely is a huge component of the new tear strength, and also definitely of the puncture resistance, because that's going to be the outside of the fabric. It's going to spread the load. It's going to help a lot. It's a very tight weave fabric as opposed to just being a grid. So hopefully we can see more of these spec sheets in the future. If we have to get them through ripstop by the roll, that's great. But I'd like to see these public somewhere. Hey, maybe on Dyneema's website. Wouldn't that be weird? So our Dyneema composites, uh, the be-all end-all of the ultralight gear world? No. They're really not, um, and there are a couple of reasons for this, um, and it's really true in the pack space, and if you want to read a little bit about why, you can head on over to Palante's site, where, you know, they've released the V2 laminate, and this is, you know, their, their most recent iteration, and they've switched from the 5-ounce uh, DCH the Dynamic Composite Hybrid, and they've gone back to dimensional polyant fabrics. So if you want to read about that, the updates and the material changes, that's here. Uh, hopefully this will stick around for a while. <laughs> I'm sure it won't be on there. It won't be on their site forever. So I'm going to hold here for a minute if you want to read this, but 
it basically is talking about how you're if you're not taping the pack they don't say that but if you're not taping it um it really makes more sense to use dimensional polyant vx series uh as long as you can get rid of the x ply which was a point of increased abrasion but these are these are still laminate fabrics it's a different totally different type of laminate uh, but as long as you're using the nylon versions which bond pretty well and uh, they have the taffeta backing you're getting you know this great waterproofness of pretty light fabric and if you if you and you can actually custom order some things and they've been able to get the v07 and v21 sire finish uh, i think that's how you pronounce that but it's it's a calendared waxed finish on what we you know come to expect from the you know vx07 vx21 series which are great ripstop nylon fabrics and it increases um that water resistance and stuff like water will bead right off of this fabric and it should be way more abrasion resistant so you know this sort of ticks all the boxes if you're not trying to tape and fully waterproof a pack for tents it's another story um so for ultralight shelters dyneema composite fabrics are really the way to go and it doesn't seem like that's going to be changing anytime soon uh there are downsides to dyneema composite fabrics you know if you put much more than eight stitches per inch and uh the non-hybrids it's it, the, you're perforating them they'll tear super super easily you have to be really careful um but with taped and bonded seams or a combination of sewn and bonded you end up with this great ultralight shelter material that doesn't stretch doesn't absorb water dries super quickly um and is permanently waterproof you're not dealing with a coating uh that's just being squeegeed onto the back side of a nylon and all that stuff it's it really does make sense uh there really is only one downside with shelters and that's when you start getting into four season gear winter um and the problem is basically just with snow and the fact that sill nylons are way slipperier uh than dyneema composites even if you get into the heavier weight dynamos that you really trust in those conditions you have to make sure you're designing way steeper walls because snow tends to stick way more to to the dyneema composite fabrics which have this light texture to them uh that's created by you know it's the mylar being sort of molded over these dyneema fibers and it gets this it's the you know the mylar, mylar layer is smooth but it's being laid over this grid and you know there's this slight surface roughness that uh, that comes with that and when you compare that to uh like a water repellent coating on a sill nylon the sill nylon is way 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 slipperier so for snowy conditions and you're if you're dealing with a lot of snow loading then dcf isn't necessarily the best choice but for three season for everything else it doesn't seem like anything's going to surpass it anytime soon